You can be seated. Thank you so much. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. First Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. This is Paul speaking. <clears throat> and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I determined to not know anything else. I determined to take away every other message. I determined to stop focusing on every other subtracting thing. I determined that my life would not be distracted by anything else. From this moment forward, I've done some ministry, but I'm shifting my message. I'm shifting my approach. I am no longer coming with anything else because I have learned that there is no message more important or powerful than Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Somebody say power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but should be in the power of God. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's not about me, what I can say, how I can conjure up a good revelation. I'm not trying to prick your ears. I'm not trying to impress you. I've laid all that aside because what I want to be seen is Jesus and him crucified. I don't sing a song so you can say how amazing my riffs are. I'm not going to come up here any longer and try to show off for you. None of that's going to happen. It's not about that anymore. What it is about is do you leave this message do you leave this service saying how amazing Gavin Tate is or do you leave saying how amazing Jesus is? Do you leave saying, oh, she has an incredible voice or are you leaving saying Jesus showed up in the room? The greatest compliment if you're a minister, if you're a singer, if you're a businessman, the greatest compliment you can ever get. It's not, oh, you're incredible. It's Jesus was so amazing. Please understand where Paul is coming from. Paul has just come from Acts chapter 17 from the town of Athens. In Athens, it was the height of all philosophical knowledge. You have your greatest debaters, people in philosophy were there. The Bible says that he was approaching it by speaking on their level. He was a very educated man. So Paul is there and he says, he begins philosophically trying to debate with them. It said he even began to quote one of their poets, one of their famous poets. And the Bible says that after he left Athens, he said from that city, some were saved. It said a few actually, a few people actually believed in the message and were saved. So he gets on a boat and he heads into the next port city of Acts chapter 18, which is the port city of Corinth. And just like many port cities, there are many sins going on. There are prostitutes, uh, drunks, all this stuff was happening in the port city, but it was also happening in the church. So you see in Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he's correcting them for a lot of things. But you notice that something happens in Corinthians when he makes this statement. So something must have happened when he left Athens and he said a few were saved. And when he was on that boat ride, he must have been thinking to himself, maybe there's a better way of doing this. Am I really coming across this the right way? You see, even us as ministers, we can, we can forget the main thing. You and your business, you can forget the main thing. Without God, could you even create wealth? Without God, would you even be here? Without what the cross did, could you even be saved? Without what the cross did, do you actually have the opportunity now to have eternal life with Jesus and go to heaven? There's no other basis but the cross. And Paul must have been thinking on that 
boat ride saying, there's got to be something better. Am I going to keep doing it this way? And by the time he gets to Corinth, he had made up his mind to say, I have determined from this moment forward my message will no longer be about trying to get to your intellect. It won't be trying to relate to you in this thing. It won't be trying to fall on any of that. He said, but I will have one message with my life for the rest of my life. And this message is the cornerstone of all the existence. It is the greatest message of all time. It is the message that goes on from the eons of all the past all the way to when time finally ends. It is a message that transcends through the cosmos. It is a message that comes from every little boy who can get it, to every little girl, to every grown up man and woman. This message is the message. And he said, I determined it will only be Jesus and him crucified from this moment on. And in that city, it is estimated in one visit, 25,000 people were saved from Paul's message. When he shifted trying to have this tactic, and he went back to the main thing of the main thing. You see, it's all about the cross. My message today is it's all about the cross. Is that what your life says? Is that the message of your life? Is that the focus of your life? We've been given so many great things in Jesus, but do you know it's only because of the cross? We've been given opportunity to have life, peace, happiness, wholeness, but do you know it's only because of the cross? Do you know that you can get distracted from the main message? You know, Galatians 3.1, listen to this. Paul talks to the Galatians and he says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed and crucified. You see, every other church, he addressed with grace and peace be unto you. But the Galatian church was the only one. He was so upset with what was going on that he had to start out by saying, listen, I, what are you guys doing? I am, in, verse, in chapter one, he says, I am so shocked that you have so easily fell and followed another gospel, something else. I'm so shocked. You saw Jesus crucified. You know what happens? Satan has a plan for his church. Satan has a plan for the church of Jesus. And you know, if he can't get you necessarily to totally fall away, you know what he will do? He'll just distract you with things that are not mattering. He'll put in front of you other things. You know what a church is without the cross? It's a church that's full of theology, but never revelation. It's a church that's full of education instead of transformation of character. It's a church that's full of psychology instead of supernatural discernment. It's a church that's filled with programs and schedules and clocks instead of ever being led by the supernatural leading of the Holy Ghost. It's a church that's full of entertainment, but never the true power of God. You have to create the glory of God by filling it with smoke. Because if the real glory of God came down, you wouldn't be able to operate your lights. You wouldn't be able to operate the things that are around. We all be on our faces screaming, holy, holy, holy. We wouldn't even be able to stand. You don't want to trade entertainment for the power of God. We have to beware as a church. It's a church full of reasoning and intellect instead of true faith, the faith that we walk by, the faith that we're victorious by. It's a church full of laws and rules trying to change you instead of allowing the supernatural love of Jesus Christ to come and break down even the hardest of hearts. This is a church without the cross. And Paul comes and he says, who bewitched you? The word is, who's put a spell on you? How did you fall for it? You know the only way you fall for it? If you get your eyes off of the cross. Please understand, anybody could fall for this. Pastors could fall for this. Our businesses, our families. But if you put the cross back in the center of your life, everything that Jesus paid for is available to you. Do you know the entire Bible is about the cross? give you a couple examples. Let's start at the very beginning. Adam and Eve. Let's start at Adam and Eve. The Bible says that there was a time they sinned and it says after they sin, God comes to them and the man blames the woman and the woman blames the snake. And God says, you are going to have to be cast out of this garden, but your seed will come later 
Eve and that seed will crush the head of Satan who is he talking about but Jesus because Jesus on the cross crushed the head of Satan how about after they had sinned remember when they had sinned it said that they were so they had been wearing fig leaves they'd never seen themselves before you see you're not conscience you're not self-consciousness is an enemy self-consciousness is an enemy of your life Jesus consciousness is where you find freedom so they literally never saw themselves they didn't even know they were naked but one day they sin and it says that they have to do what they have to after the first sacrifice of a human of an animal and they cover themselves with these skins because the only thing that can cover your sin is blood and from that moment in Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation you see one line going throughout the Bible not without blood not without blood every priest had to sacrifice blood everyone had to come in for the atonement because there was still not a good enough sacrifice but there was one blood that was shed on this cross that covered us forever and ever and ever for the sins of all the past for the sins of the present and the sins of the future how about Abraham let's think about some characters in the Bible it's all about the cross, just so you know. I'm only giving you a few characters. I'm only giving you a few examples, but from Genesis to Revelation, did you know it's 66 books? All about one man, his name is Jesus and his cross. Let's think about Abraham. The Bible says that Abraham wakes up one day and God tells him, I need you to go sacrifice your son. So he wakes up early in the morning, which is pretty incredible. And it says that he gets his son and he says, we're going to go up and worship the Lord. By the way, worship is not a song that you sing. Worship is not the slow music that's in the room. Worship is not the Bethel song or the song that came from here. That's not worship. The first time worship is mentioned in the Bible is let us go up and sacrifice. Worship is a sacrifice. So he comes up and he says, I want you to take the sticks, Isaac. Watch this. And I want you to put them on your back. And I want you to take up the sticks up the mountain to the sacrifice. Who's Isaac? Jesus. Going up the mountain to offer himself. You see, theologians and everybody knows, Isaac did not fight when Abraham said, you need to be on the altar. Actually, Isaac willingly put himself on the altar because he was as dedicated to God's will as Abraham was. The son carried the wood up the mountain. And we all know the story. He lifts up his, uh, his knife and he's about to kill his son. But right before it happens, the angel calls out and says, Stop. I know that you fear God. You obey me all the way, not partially. You obey me immediately, not delayed. You obey me and I can see now. You see, the story of Abraham was never ever about Isaac dying. It was always about Abraham dying. The death that Jesus wanted was never Isaac's. The death he wanted was Abraham's. His will died that day with God. And it says that there was a ram hiding in the thicket. Who's the ram? Jesus. Because Jesus came and offered himself so that we would not have to pay the penalty that we deserve. What about Joseph? Let's follow the story of Joseph. Do you know it's actually all about Jesus? Joseph is the type of Jesus. Favorite of his father, sent to his brothers, betrayed by his brothers, sold for 30 pieces of silver. And then after he goes into thrown into jail, that's the death of Jesus, he's raised out into the place of honor where every knee bows at the right hand of the highest ruler that's the ascension and resurrection of jesus how about the tabernacle you know maybe you skip this portion of the bible you know leviticus numbers all that i want the the sideboard to be six foot long you know and and 15 cubits deep and then you're like oh my gosh what is all this maybe you skip through don't feel bad but do you know it's all about Jesus let's just start with the entrance for instance there's a gate here that's down in the left hand corner where you have to enter in you can't enter in without going through this gate the gate is made up of four colors the colors are 
purple, scarlet red, white, and blue. Purple, that's the book of Matthew. Jesus is the king. You can't even truly receive Jesus unless you receive him as the king now. You're not truly saved just by saying a prayer. You are saved when you make Jesus the only king on the throne of your heart. We come to the white, that's the book of Mark. He's the man. How could you have gotten saved if you didn't know there was a man who could relate to you? Who went through the things you go through? Who went through the same pains you go through? Who walked through this life so that when you sin, so that when you go through, what you're going to say, God, I need your help. He understands you. He's the perfect man. We come then through the scarlet red. That's Jesus in the book of Luke the Savior. He's the suffering Savior. If you didn't know that he was a Savior, you could not have come to get saved. How about the book of John? That's the blue. That's Jesus as the Son of God. You see, you had to believe he was the Son of God, not just a good prophet, not just a good teacher, but he is the Son of God who came down to save you, who came as a perfect man, and now he sits enthroned as the King of kings and Lord of lords, and that's in four colors. But let me show you this just real quick. There is a corner, every corner of the tabernacle, it said that there was a place where there are posts that were created. Now on each of these posts, there is a hook that comes from the post. It comes down to a line of fine linen. The host is silver, the hook. That means persecution. The fine linen, perfect man. Into a nail that's made of brass, suffering. The brass nail could only be nailed halfway down because God said, Moses, tell them not to nail it all the way in. Why? Because the persecuted, perfect man would suffer a death, but he would rise again from the grave, so you can't put it all the way in the ground. So we get the entire gospel through a hook, a line, a brass nail. The whole Bible is about the cross. How about the beginning of the Bible? Can I just, can I keep going a little bit? How about the beginning of the Bible? The first three words of the Bible, in the beginning, let's look at this. In the beginning, the letters are Bet Resh Alaf Shin Yud Tav. It means this, Bet Resh means son of, Aleph, ox head, power, authority, strength to be used, which represents God. Shin, two front teeth, meaning sharp, pressed to eat. The function is to destroy. Yud, arm, meaning work, make the deed of, function of the hand, tav, cross sticks, meaning mark, sign, signal, and monument. All together, you put these together, the Son of God will be destroyed by His own work on the cross. That's in the first three words of the Bible. But it even goes further back than that, because look at what the Bible says. Revelation 13, 8, all who dwell on the earth. Woo! will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world you see before the first words were even written in the bible before the first thing was even made and created jesus was already dead rose from the dead all in the heart of his father that's how much god loves you do you know that your body declares the wonders of the cross? Yeah, the Bible we know, but do you know that your body, your actual body, declares the wonders of the cross? Well, they look at DNA and they begin to look under it on a, a microscope. And they found in the DNA, as they looked at all the things, that there's a thing called laminin. Laminin is responsible for holding all your cells together. It actually is what you could call the glue. It holds you together so you don't break apart. Without laminin, you would literally just disintegrate and break apart all over the stage. You are being held together by this. They looked at it under a microscope. I'm gonna show you what they found. Here's the picture they came back with and here's what it looked like. Colossians 1:17. He holds all things together. By the word of his mouth, in him and through him are all things held together. Your body declares the story of the cross. Does your mouth? Your body knows the story of the cross. Does your mind? You know the cosmos speaks of the story of the cross? Yeah, the cosmos. You know, we have telescopes, right? They go really, really, really far. 
And we've discovered that there's not just one galaxy, there's millions of galaxies that all have stars and planets in them. Well, they have this telescope, latest technology called the Hubble telescope. The Hubble telescope went out 1100 light years. Not a little bit, 1100 light years, y'all. Really far out. And they begin to find clusters of patterns that were going on with galaxies. And they found all these galaxies, and so they went to the center galaxy of these galaxies. So you gotta understand, this is what they found in the center galaxy of all the galaxies, and then they went to the center star of that galaxy, and this is what came back on the picture. The Bible declares the message of the cross. Your body declares the message of the cross. The cosmos declares the message of the cross. It's the center for it. Jesus says, if you don't praise me, the rocks themselves will not be able to contain it. They're going to praise me. The earth knows the message of the cross. Is your life about the cross? Every person who's watching today and every person who's in this building, I want to speak to you real quick. If you're at your house right now, if you're sitting on the couch, on your bed, wherever you might be at, in your car, if you're in this building, I want you to not withhold your praise and your worship today as you might be overwhelmed with thankfulness as we begin to continue to speak about the glory of the cross. This is the greatest message of all of history and all of mankind. There is no message greater than this. I want you to know that in any moment, when you feel God is touching you, I want you to stand up and praise and raise your hands to God and just say thank you. What you're doing is responding to what God's about to do in your life. When we say thank you and give God glory, we begin to respond and allow his work to flow. Breakthroughs are going to happen in your marriage because the cross will do it. Many of you will be healed. There was a, a seriously beautiful anointing of healing that was in the room, this last service. It's still here. Many of you will begin to feel body parts and things begin to shift. And what I want you to do is put your hand on that part of your body where you're feeling pain. And I just want you to release it and just say, Lord, I receive you in Jesus' name. I receive your healing. It all comes from the cross. God bless you today. At any moment, just praise him. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Can you say that with me? The power of God. Say it. The power of God. The cross is what? The power of God. Say it over here. The cross is what? The power of God. It's not your words. It's not the smoke. It's not the lights. Please do not be fooled. The power of God is not your great idea. The power of God is the cross. The cross is what God uses. The cross is how you get out of a divorce and God brings you back together. The cross is what's used to heal your sick body. God takes the cross and he uses it on your depression. God takes the cross and he uses it on your suicidal thoughts. God takes the cross and he rubs it into your bitterness where you never could forgive, but the cross can do it. The cross can do it. God's taking the cross and all around this room and people are online right now. God is using the cross. You see, the more you understand the cross, the deeper in the power of God you will get. The more you get revelations of what the cross has already done, the more you will receive what is available for you. Philippians 2, 12 through 13, mighty anointing in this room right now. Not as I have been just in your presence, but it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. It is God who is working you. What's he working in you? The cross. He's taking the cross and he's working it into your desires. He's changing your desires. Somebody need this today. You've been asking God, I don't want it anymore. You've been saying it. Say, God, I don't want it anymore. God, I want your desire. If that's you, stand up on your feet and praise him right now. Just lift your hand, just thank him. Just begin to thank him, thank him, thank him. Because God is taking his cross. There's an anointing that's in this room. There's an anointing that's coming over this camera right now that God is taking the anointing from his cross and he's working it into your desires. You see, as long as you focus on the cross, everything is yours. It's available to you. We don't deserve it. It's not something we deserved, but the cross is the center of all things. The cross is the reason why. It's all about the cross. There's a man, there's an anointing right now. Somebody's getting healed in their bladder. You've had a urinary infection. You're being healed right now in this room. 
Somebody in your left ear is beginning to open. It's happening right over here on this side. You're starting to feel your left ear is beginning to open up. God is moving. It's the cross. It's the healing of the cross. You see, it says he works it into your desires. He takes it from your desires. And he doesn't just let you have desires. He gives you the power to follow through. Some of y'all have the desire, but you have not been able to follow through. Put your hands up. He'll give you the power to follow through. These habits will not last forever. These things are not going to stay in your life forever. Just put the cross on it. Just let the cross begin to work it in you right now. Receive what he's done for you. Here are the reasons why we love and why we need the cross and why it's all about it. Number one, it was the only perfect, all-sufficient sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 11 through 14 says, every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for the sins forever, for how many sins forever? For how many sins forever? He sat down at the right hand of God from that time until his enemies were made his, under his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. You see, when you got saved, God consecrated you. But consecration is different than sanctification. When you got saved, God set you apart because before you were formed in your mother's womb, every person under the sound of my voice, God had a purpose for you. He already had a destiny for you. You might not still know it. You might not know exactly what it is, but he's working it in you. You see, he's working it in you. Sanctification is what you do to yourself. God consecrated you, it's what he did. But sanctification, you do it to yourself. You keep yourself set apart from the world. You keep yourself making the decisions to be pure. You keep yourself saying, God, I'm used for you. I'm not gonna be going back to that life anymore. I'm not even thinking about going back to that girlfriend, that boyfriend, they're not for me. I'm sanctifying myself. I'm setting myself apart. And God says, as long as you make that choice, I'll keep working the cross into your life. I'll give you the power that you never even knew you had. I'll give you the willpower. You won't just keep going in circles anymore. Isaiah 53, 6. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We've left God's path to follow our own way. Yet the Lord has laid on him the sins of us all. Isaiah 53, 6. Listen. All the evil came upon Jesus so that all the good could come upon you. All the evil came upon Jesus so that all the good could come upon you. Jesus didn't just take evil, he became evil. He became sin. He didn't just take your sin, he became sin so that you and I could receive the forgiveness of God today. Man, God is speaking to people all over this building right now. This is, whew, this is serious. Romans 8, 31 through 32. What shall we then say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also with us freely give us what? All things. You see, the only reason you get to have all the good things of Jesus is because of what he did on the cross, because Jesus took it so you could have it. Everybody listen. The only reason, listen, this is one of the greatest revelations I ever had since becoming a believer. When you get saved after the cross, you no longer get what you deserve. You get what Jesus deserves. You gotta hear what I just said. You gotta receive this. You no longer are now entitled to what you deserve. You are entitled to what Jesus deserves. I understand you don't deserve to be forgiven. Does Jesus? I understand that you don't deserve to be healed. Would Jesus? I understand you don't deserve that mercy. Does Jesus? I understand. You see, it's not about you anymore. It's not about you anymore. It's not about you anymore. It's about Jesus. It's all about the cross. Number two, only through the cross is God's supernatural grace released. I'm not going to read the whole scripture, but Paul's sitting there. He's with him and he says, listen, he says, I got this thorn in my side, God. Can you please take it? He said, again and again, I came to God and asked him to take it. And he came back with this response. My grace is sufficient for you. You see, grace is so powerful. This is, this is illustration. Watch this. Grace is what God requires. Say God has a standard that he requires patience. Some of y'all are really terrible at patience. <laughs> you just can't stand people. <laughs> well, praise God. I would be the greatest Christian in the world if there were no other people. I'm with you. Anyway, 
So, grace, the Bible, so if God requires this much of you when it comes to patience, in your own ability, you actually are only able to give this much. Your, your patience runs out. What grace is, is grace does not begin until your strength ends. Grace doesn't begin until you end. So grace is God's supernatural ability that goes beyond your own ability. So if you only go here, grace takes over and it gives you what God requires. So you require patience, you require mercy, whatever the standard is, you can only do so much, but grace takes the rest of the load and gives you what you cannot do. Somebody praise God for the grace of God because grace is his ability that goes beyond our own ability you see, the purpose of the cross is to bring us to the end of our own strength and wisdom. The cross takes your wisdom and it says it's nothing. The cross takes your strength and it says it's nothing. So that God's grace can truly begin in our lives. God's grace does not begin until you end. 1 Corinthians 1, 20 through 25. Just receive these words today, y'all. The presence of God is here. We're speaking His gospel. We're speaking the good news. For Jews request a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach, what do we preach? Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks it's foolishness, but to those who are called, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. What's he saying? He's saying that it's foolishness to people who aren't saved, that a God would unzip his divinity, that he would come down into the womb of a woman for nine months, that he would walk among us in this dirty, wretched world, and that he would not be blamed of anything, but he would go onto a cross and he would die for something he never did. That's stupid. That's foolish. But to us who have been saved, it is the greatest news. It is the greatest thing because we need it. Don't expect the world to understand the message. You just need them to receive it. God didn't cause you to understand everything. He just wants you to open up your arms and receive it. He gave it to you. See, the greatest idea that scripture says that you could ever have, it's God's dumbest. The strongest you could ever get on your own is the weakest God could ever be. Why don't we just stop? Why don't we stop all this stuff? Why don't we stop all this striving and hassling? Why don't we go back to the cross and find our strength? Why don't we say, Lord, you got to work it in me. Lord, I depend on you. I bring you my heart. Number three, the message of the cross is the only message that God gives his confirmation by releasing supernatural signs and wonders. Oh my God, I love talking about this. First Corinthians uh, four, uh, 2, 4 through 5, watch this. My speech and my preaching were not persuasive. But I didn't come to you with human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit of the power of God. Only the message of the cross does God confirm with signs and wonders. He doesn't confirm a pet talk. He does not confirm a pep talk. He does not confirm with signs and wonders motivational speaking. He doesn't confirm with signs and wonders a really intellectual guy who speaks really great. He doesn't confirm with signs and wonders because you make the entire crowd stand up because of your beautiful voice, because you receive awards, because you stand and say, I thank God, even though everything I sang about was against him. He doesn't confirm it. He only confirms one message, the message of the cross. If you'll just speak the cross, You'll reach the most intellectual, you'll reach the dumb, you'll reach the poor, you'll reach the rich. The message of the cross is what God has equipped you with so that supernatural signs will flow through your hand. Not just mine, not just Pastor Marcos, but it's time for you to get somebody healed. It's time for you to see a breakthrough. It's time for you to usher in the power of God. Quickly. I just want to announce on July the 22nd, we're having a God encounter in this room. I'm going to teach everybody exactly what we just said. Healing, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, all that. I invite you all please to be here. We're going to be recording it for all of our campuses. God bless you. That will be Saturday. Number four, the cross is the sole reasons, oh, this is so good, for Satan's absolute and total defeat. <laughs> Guys, without the cross, Satan would still rule everything. Without the cross, Satan would rule everything. What do you mean, Gavin, rule everything? Well, do you remember when uh, Jesus is being tempted in the desert? 
you remember Jesus, he comes to him and he says, um, he says, I'll give you all of this land if you'll just bow down to me. Well, why did he say that? Because he owned all of it. The devil did own all the land. That's why he told him, I'll give it to you if you bow down. How is that impossible? How is that possible? Well, Romans 5, 12 tells you. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. It brought death to everyone. So through one man's sin, he handed over the authority given to Adam and he gave it to Satan. The authority of dominion that we had was handed over to the enemy. The Bible then says, look at this, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who believe. So Satan actually is the God of this world, the world. But when you receive Jesus, he becomes the God of your world. So here's the deal. Before you get saved, Satan rules your life. It, you, when it, whatever you're doing, he's the boss. But when you receive Jesus, you take yourselves out of the bondage of his authority, and now you're under the authority of God. You have to understand, one man lost it, and according to Romans 5, 17 through 19, here we go. Jesus, through one man's sin, Adam lost it, but watch this. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings new right relationship with God. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners, but because one other person he was the second man, Adam. His name was Jesus. He obeyed God. Many will be made righteous. One man lost it, but one man got it back. Colossians 2, 13 to 15. I'm going to close with this. and We're going to continue on Wednesday. But let me tell you this. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive in Christ, for he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record and charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Oh, listen to this. In this way, he disarmed every spiritual ruler and authority. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them with the cross. Look at how the Passion says it. Then Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon in their spiritual authority. And by the power of the cross, listen, Jesus led them around. He led them around. He led them around. As prisoners in a procession of triumph, he was not their prisoner. They were his. Jesus took your suicide and he led it through Satan. Oh, you got to hear me. <laughs> oh, God, thank you, Jesus. Jesus took your suicidal thoughts. He chained it up and he led it through hell and he said, what you gonna do now, Satan? What you gonna, Jesus took your depression. He chained it up and he led it through hell. What you gonna do now, Satan? Oh, oh. hallelujah. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't keep it together, y'all. This is, he, he took, he took the, I understand you're going through something with your husband and wife right now, I hear you. You don't think you're going to get through it. But don't you know God took that devil. Jesus took that thing coming against your marriage. And he led it through hell. And he had his chest out. And he was looking with smiles all around hell. Because the devil could do nothing about it. He had nothing to have. The demons could do nothing about it. They had nothing to have. And Jesus took them. Jesus went to the enemy's own turf and he defeated him on his home field. Every eye closed, every eye closed. There's so much more I don't want to talk about, but please come back Wednesday. Every eye closed. The presence of God is so sweet. God made available to us through the cross, an answer to destroy the number one tool of Satan, which has held many of you back for so long, guilt, guilt and shame. He created a tool called forgiveness, total forgiveness of any sin that you would confess. Not sins that you keep to yourself, but sins that you confess. 
Today I'm going to ask, it's your turn, it's your time. Prayer team, please come up. <laughs> it's not about confessing your sins to just somebody else, even though God uses that so you can be healed ultimately. Jesus already knows. He already knows what's in your life and what you've done. It's about letting it go to God. It's keeping you down. Guilt and shame will keep you back from your destiny. Because of the cross, you're not worthy of it. Jesus is worthy of it. But he said you can have it. I'm not worthy of it. Jesus is worthy of it. But he said you can have it. Every person, quickly open your eyes and look at me. How wide really is this cross? Is it really only a few feet? Or was Jesus in that position with his arms open wide? Because he was saying, this is the widest I can get. The width of the love of God does not stop where the cross stopped. It goes all the way to China. It wraps around all the way to the ends of the earth this direction. How wide is the love of God? How high is the love of God? You see, it doesn't just stop here. It goes all the way into the heavens. And only because the cross touched heaven could it come down to earth for us through one man, Jesus. And only because the depth of the cross touched the earth could it take and be the only way why Jesus is the one way to, to God. Because it's only through him that we can now go back to heaven. How really low, what is the depth of the cross? Is it deep enough to get you when you're in your crack addict state? Is it deep enough to find you in the midst of an alley? Is it deep enough to heal you even though you have sins that you would never say in front of anyone else? Was it deep enough? Did it go low enough to where you were so ashamed? Where you were in a state where nobody could help you? Where you couldn't even look at yourself in the mirror? Is it deep enough to find you with a needle in your arm? Was it deep enough to find you in a place where you were about to give it all up? Was it deep enough? Where does really the love of God end? How deep really is it? Paul says, how deep, how wide, how high is the love of God? Right now, if your heart is burning and you want to know this Jesus, come to the cross right now. Step, come right now. Come right now. Come out of your seat right now. This is for you. Come out of your seat. Here they come. Here they come. Come out of your seat. This is your moment. This is your moment. Come out of your seat right now. Come on. There she's coming from the back. Give her a hand right here. Coming over here. Come on. It's your moment. Don't wait any longer. This is it. This is it. Come on. Give my hand. Hallelujah. We love you. We love you. We love you. Any doubts, get them settled right now. You need peace with God. Come to the front. Any doubts, get them settled right now. You want peace with God. Come to the front. Come on, keep giving them a hand. They're still coming. I see you over here. We're waiting for you. Look at this whole family. This whole family is coming up together. A whole family. A whole family getting saved. Come on. <laughs> Man, I love that. Oh. oh, my. Three kids and a husband and a wife. Come on. Whole family. Look at this right here. We got another son coming right here. Hey, we love y'all. Let's go. Second altar call is they're still coming up. These people are about to pray. They're about to ask God to touch them. I'm going to ask one more. If you say my life has not been about the cross, Gavin, I'm saved. But I've been focusing and getting distracted with other things. And I'm making a fresh commitment that just like Paul said, I'm making a statement. My life will be about Jesus and him crucified. See, some of y'all have been intimidated. You don't feel you could talk to people about your faith. You don't know how. We can help you. You've been afraid. Don't be afraid. Sometimes Jesus wants you to do it afraid. Have you ever heard that? Sometimes, you know, one of the greatest personal leadership lessons you can learn, do it afraid, because Jesus is waiting. He's helping you the entire way. Right now, if you say, I'm dedicating my life to this message, put your hands in the air. Say, that's me. I'm rededicating my life to this message. Keep your hands up right now, because God right now is seeing you. 
He's going to equip you. If that's you and you're watching today, I want you to stand up where you're at in your rooms. And you're, I don't care if you're in a hotel, if you're in a living room, stand up where you're at. Put your hands in the air and say, Lord, God sees you. Every person pray this prayer with me right now out loud. Keep your hands lifted out here. Every person up here, make sure you can hear yourself say it. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I receive you as Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving me peace. Thank you for the blood that was shed for me, that you died, and that you rose again. Jesus, take over my life. I will become a disciple. I will become a disciple. This will not be a one-off. I give my life completely to your message. Make it my message. In Jesus' name. I want you right now to lift your hands and praise the God who has just saved you. Listen. Listen, y'all. Everybody, before you move, listen. This Wednesday, this Wednesday, I'm talking about the back of the cross. The stripes that healed you. Every time for the last 20 years I've talked about the back of the cross, supernatural healings will break out. I want you to bring people who are sick. I want you to bring people who have problems because the healing power of God is going to move through this room. We'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you guys so much. Pastor Christian, come on up. Come on, can we give God some praise for that message today? How many are thankful for the cross? Altar workers begin connecting with people up here. If you're up here at the altar, your next step is a class called Starting at the Way. The person in front of you, they're going to sign you up. Just open up the app and they're going to get you connected. Once you get signed up, we have books and devotionals for you. Pastor Fernando's here. He has a book. If I can show that. If you're at the altar, we have a book for you. We want to help you grow your next step. It's a devotional we're going to help you with. Thank you, Pastor Fernando. We love you so much. We'll see you guys Wednesday. Don't forget Wednesday. We're going to do part two of this and start talking about the back of the cross. We love you. Wednesday at 7 p.m. We'll see you. Remember, if God is for you, there's no one who can come against you. If you need any prayer, come forward. We have a team that would love to pray with you. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.